All right, so this is basically where we left off in the last lecture, and um, you really got into how an action potential worked, and so now we're gonna start focusing in on um, basically some other aspects of the action potential. I'll initially start off with kind of a little bit of a reminder of how the action potential works. Then we'll get into a little bit about salatory conduction. Salatory means jumping, and this is how the uh, myelin sheath helps to, helps to speed up a action potential down the axon. We'll get into a little bit more details about what's happening at the synapse and the release of acetylcholine at, at the synapse, um, which is an excitatory um, neural transmitter. And so in this picture here, we see, um, and you can look at my cursor, you can see basically, um, here we have some excitatory synapses. The synapses are down here. That's the little space between the end of this axon terminal and this cell body of the next neuron. So remember the other neurons would be up here somewhere, well beyond this slide. And so we're seeing the uh, synapses coming off of these axon terminals um, and they're synapsing onto the cell body and they're causing a excitatory response in this particular scenario. Excitatory means to depolarize and potentially stimulate an action potential. So as you probably should understand, signals travel down um, axons and then they'll reach the dendrites of another neuron and then release that neural transmitter that then will either excite or inhibit an action potential occurring in the next neuron. So in the next neuron, we have an excitatory response that's occurring inside the cell body. Inside the cell body, we call it a graded potential. It's a little different than an action potential in that it can be at different um, levels of being more positive or more negative in charge. While an action potential tends to be an all or nothing event where it reaches a certain plateau and basically replicates it perfectly every time or nearly the same or exactly the same every time. So where does this ultimately get determined is in the axon hillock. The axon hillock is full of voltage-gated uh, channels that are either sodium or potassium, and they're just loaded with it. And so if the positive charge in the cell body reaches this area of loaded with sodium channels that are voltage-gated, if they reach that threshold of um, around uh, what negative 55 millivolts, it'll turn on and trigger those um, sodium channels to open and for sodium to come into the um, axon hillock. So it becomes more positive. And if it reaches that threshold, it will actually trigger an action potential to travel down the axon. So we've, we've kind of hit on this before, but I just want to make sure you realize this axon hillock is kind of the deciding area in the nerve before an action potential actually travels down the axon. And so when you see um, that we're going to zoom in and we're looking at the axon hillock or just a little bit above it, this area right here, you see that the sodium channels open if it reached, reached that threshold and then it starts traveling down the axon. And again, I talked about this in the last um, slides. The sodium travels down, opens up the sodium channels, and continues traveling down the axon. So if you see time zero, time one, and time two, that's yeah, kind of before, and then after, then after, after, right? So it's just kind of, you're getting to see what happens as it travels down the axon. And so the sodium opens up these other sodium channels further down the axon, allowing sodium to enter. Um, and right immediately behind it, that sodium charge caused the potassium to leave. 
So this is depolarization where we see that yellow spark in this picture. And then right behind it, the inside of the neurons becoming more negative again. So on point A, on time zero, you can see that that area is positive momentarily. And if you go to time one, it's becoming more negative again because the potassium is leaving. And in time two, you see we're reset and ready for another action potential. So in time one, we're seeing what we call hyperpolarization. And then in time two, we call repolarization. We're back to normal. And so the sodium continues down the axon, opening up the next set of sodium channels. Again, it's going to initially open up the activation channel. Sodium is going to come in. And then once the sodium reaches a certain plateau, remember around uh, 50 millivolts or 70 millivolts or something like that. Um, I think it's actually 50 millivolts. The activation or the inactivation gate will come in and close the sodium channel so they can no longer open and no more sodium can come in. And then the potassium channels are opening up and that's what happens up and down the axon. If this seems a little bit confusing, it's good again to go back and watch my previous video or at least those sections or the YouTube has lots of um, action potential videos that are good animations. So now we're gonna talk about, so this is how it travels down, but notice along this axon, we also have these groups of cells that are called um, Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes, depending on whether we're talking about in the central nervous system or in the peripheral nervous system. If it is in the central nervous system, the, the myelin sheath is made up of oligodendrocytes. If it's found in the peripheral nervous system, it's made up of Schwann cells. And that myelin sheath is what speeds up an action potential. It makes the nerves um, have an impulse that's more rapid. And then it'll travel down to the axon terminals. So the membrane potential is a negative 70 millivolts. So this is what's showing what this, this graph is kind of depicting what's happening at any given location on a neuron. We have this machine here that's measuring the voltage changes because remember it's electrical chemical voltage change. And so the inside of the neuron is at the rusting membrane potential something triggers an action potential. We begin to see depolarization. And so it reaches up around negative 55 millivolts. The sodium channel is open. Again, I'm pretty redundant on what I'm trying to tell you. But the sodium, but what happens is depolarization occurs. We see lots of sodium channels open downstream. And then when we reach around 30 millivolts, I said 70 earlier, 50, but either way around 30 millivolts, plus or minus 10 or 20, um, we have the inactivation gate closed. No more sodium comes in, yet sodium channels, or excuse me, potassium channels open. Potassium leaves bringing the inside, making it more negative. And that's what's happening in six. Um, basically, we're beginning to have repolarization. That means it's becoming more negative. We have a tip, a, a, a dip down here at seven because what happens is more potassium leaves momentarily to actually make the inside more negative than the resting membrane. So it might actually get down to negative 80 millivolts momentarily. And then those potassium channels will close, no more potassium's leaving. And then, we, and then everything kind of settles and we're back to a resting membrane of negative 70 millivolts. So we call this little dip hyperpolarization. Hopefully you recall that from our previous um, slides. And so here's the action potential occurring. Sodium, you can see how sodium is closely following that increase. And then when sodium is no longer increasing, we see that the action potential is falling. And while the action potential is falling, it's also following the, the uh, 
voltage is actually falling also because the potassium is leaving the neuron. So again, sodium comes in, increases the enzyme, makes it more positive. Potassium leaves, making it more negative. And this is all due to those voltage-gated sodiums and voltage-gated potassiums. Not to be confused with the sodium potassium pump. That's always over here on the side that's doing its thing, getting kind of getting all the conditions set up to make everything work at one time. Those momentary action potentials and depolarization is due to the voltage gated channels. The repolarization and hyperpolarization is due to the potassium channels. The sodium potassium pump again is just doing, is just in the background helping to maintain conditions over a long period of time. These are short and rapid. So again, an action potential is an all or nothing event that can travel a long distance down the axon. Um, it's self-regenerating. Once it gets repolarized, and we're back to our resting membrane potential, then the nerve can go undergo another action potential. So when you have a long nerve fiber, you may have multiple action potentials traveling down the nerve fiber at any given moment. Um, so you can have action potential that has started here, has traveled down, and there's another one starting. And so there's two traveling down the axon. So it's the frequency, meaning the number of times an action potential travels down, let's say a motor neuron, that influences how strong your muscle contraction will be. Um, so those are examples, for instance. Now, the Schwann cells help to speed up, Schwann cells help to speed up an action potential down the neuron. Some animals don't uh, utilize um, myelin sheath, the Schwann cells, or the oligodendrocytes, depending on where we're talking, as much. In these cases, um, they use large diameter axons. So the so something like a uh, cephalopod, which is a very smart invertebrate, I tend to have really, you know, I'm making an exaggeration by making my hand represent, but the axon is is substantially larger. In diameter, and that also helps to speed up an action potential. But in our case, we've evolved to use these myelin sheaths, while the arthropod tends to use larger axon diameter. Both cases, what happens is the sodium stays more concentrated, helping to speed up a nerve impulse. Now, when some people have um, things like multiple sclerosis, the autoimmune disease actually attacks the Schwann cells in the myelin sheath stripping it away and making it so um, an action potential doesn't work as well. So this picture here is showing you again a neuron and just and again motor neuron tends to be our example. Um, you can see there's different electrodes that have been pushed into this cell membrane and as the action potentials travel down the nerve you can see the action potentials are traveling and initially it's strong and then the next set gets stronger and so forth. Um, so it's just showing how it's the set of sodium channels open and so forth. But as I mentioned before, you can have multiple action potentials traveling down a nerve. And so here's showing that the action potential travels down the neuron from the cell body and the dendrites down to the axon terminals. Here's needles that are measuring the electrical stimulus and you can see it's traveling down with electrodes. <clears throat> this kind of just summarizes everything I've talked about. The concentration of sodium and potassium are the, um, across the membrane is the battery. This is the electric, can be measured electric, electrical signal. It's chemical obviously because it's also, um, you know, atoms like cations and stuff like that. And again, it's only a small amount of potassium or sodium that's needed to make these changes in millivolts. It's not like, even though I talk about sodium rushing in, it really doesn't take that many sodium ions 
to come in to, to increase the millivolts. It doesn't take that much potassium to leave to decrease the inside. But once we have repolarization, the battery is essentially recharged. It's, it does so very rapidly. It doesn't require, it doesn't even need the sodium potassium pump to get everything set and ready to go. It's just enough just to move a few ions and we're back to the normal. So we can literally have thousands of action potentials before the sodium potassium pump would really need to get everything corrected. I mentioned before, um, things like the squid have larger axons. So one giant axon from a squid is 0.8 millimeters in diameter. Um, so giant squids have large uh, neur neurons and axons, relatively speaking. So in other words, it's, a, it's um, dramatically larger than what we see in mammals. So in vertebrates, us, because we have a backbone, animals with a backbone, it's, an, it's impractical to increase the, the velocity by increasing the axon size because of the very large number of axons present. We just have lots and lots of axons. And if they were all the size of a something we saw in a squid, it would not fit. I mean, it'd be just too large. So the Schwann cells, as you recall, are the myelin. And this is what is this wrapper that seems to speed up action potentials. Between these myelin sheaves, there's this little space or gap. And as I already mentioned, we call this the nodes of Ranavir. And again, what is the point of those? Um, they make the action potentials travel quickly. We call that salatory conduction. So the nodes actually allow the action potentials to jump down the axon. Here you can see the myelin sheath is wrapping around the axon. And so what you see in this picture here is kind of like what we saw a few slides ago where we had an action potential traveling down a axon, but in this case, what it's showing you here is the myelin sheath seems to be concentrating the sodium so that when it travels down to the next node of Ranavir, it's already concentrated enough to open it up rapidly. And as you can see right behind it, what's happening in time one, section three, point A, the potassium channels have opened, so it's now hyper, it's repolarizing and right behind it, then ultimately hyperpolarizing, and then back to resting membrane. And then what do we see down here at point C at time two? That concentrated sodium traveled down and opened up those sodium ch channels. So essentially, it's jumped from node to Renovir to node to Renovir. So this dramatically increases the speed of an action potential. So the travel, and remember, axons are long. You know, they're going from your spinal cord down to your toes, for instance. So this myelin sheath is really important for speeding up an action potential. And then, uh, let's see. So we call that salatory conduction. I'm going the wrong way. We call that salatory conduction. So. It, Again, it jumps from one node of Renovir to the next node of Renovir. If we were to unmyelinate the axon, the current would travel much slower. And so that's what's shown in this picture here. If um, we removed the myelin sheath, the salutary conduction would fail because we'd have a lot more leakage, a lot more dilution of the sodium. And so it'd be less, able to open up the sodium channels downstream. But by having that myelin sheath, we maintain a strong concentration of sodium that's needed to open up the, the sodium channels more rapidly in these nodes of Renovir. Because remember, the sodium channels are voltage gated. They have to reach that threshold of around uh, negative 55 millivolts from negative 70 to negative 55, and then we have our action potential take place. Uh-uh. <clears throat>
Okay, so this one, let me just pause it for a second. I'll get back to it in a second. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to try to walk you through this slide a little bit. Um, don't get too freaked out if you don't fully understand it. Um, you probably watched a little bit of the video. It's actually a pretty complex topic. And even here, we're talking mostly about skeletal muscle. Apparently, things can be a little different in regards to hyper. Um, Galemia and hypogalemia in regards to cardiac muscle or the heart. So there's so some of this, so what I'm really talking about applies primarily to skeletal muscle. So lots of factors and may potentially influence how much potassium is in your body. And I'm not gonna get into it in deep levels, but you know, your kidneys are involved, what you dietarily intake. If you ate a lot of potassium or if you didn't eat enough potassium or you're taking diet um, you know, you're, you, or you're taking um, pills that um, are diuretics to help you to urinate more those things influence the amount of potassium in your body your body is does a really good job of trying to regulate the amount of potassium in your body too much or too little can cause some severe problems now Looking at this slide, what I want you to try to get out of it is this is talking about um, graded potential. Remember where that takes place? And we haven't really gotten it. I have not discussed graded potential in enough details. But it, it takes place in the cell body. And remember, right at the what they call the axon hillock, the area where the axon or the cell body comes down into the axon or that, that area that kind of is cone shaped. There's lots of uh, sodium channels there. And so we need to have around a negative 55 millivolts to trigger those sodium channels to open and sodium to come in and the potassium channels to open. And we reach around 30 millivolts. Well, when you're, and that's, what, that's what's happening during um, normal conditions. So normal conditions where your potassium levels are spot on where they're supposed to be, the resting membrane potential is around negative 70 millivolts. And then if you have an excitatory response, um, that graded potential will reach potentially a negative 55 millivolts, and then you'll have your action potential that's been characterized with the sodium channels opening and the potassium channels opening ultimately and then repolarizing down to negative 70. However, in hyperacclemia, there is more potassium in your body um, than it ought to be, and more in your bloodstream. And in doing so, the inside of your cells becomes, your resting membrane becomes less negative because there's more potassium now. Because remember, the sodium potassium pump's running and starts throwing in more potassium um, inside the cell because of this extra high concentration of potassium. Now there's more potassium inside the cell, as best as I understand it, the way I interpret it. And in doing so, the inside is less negative. So now in this picture C, in a hyperacclemia situation, we're looking at around, it looks like at least in this example, around a negative um, 60 millivolts. And so what that means is it doesn't take as much to trigger an action potential. So now when the grade potential takes place and there's some excitatory response, you're more likely to get your, your nerves to fire. And that might not be a good thing. Maybe it causes muscle cramps and things like that when you have, have too much of this. But either way, your nerve stimulus occurs more rapidly, which can cause your muscle stimulus to occur more rapidly. Now, in hypoglemia, there's less potassium in your blood. Maybe you've taken too many diuretics, you pass too much potassium, you haven't reabsorbed it, or you have some type of metabolic disease. But when there's less potassium around, 
then the sodium potassium pump is not putting as much potassium in, right? So that means that the inside actually becomes more negative because remember sodium, excuse me, potassium has a positive charge. So if there's less potassium on the inside of the cell, then the negative um, organic proteins and so forth inside the neuron is gonna be even more negative relative to the sodium on the outside. And in doing so, it's less likely that you'll have an action potential occur. And so your muscles might become sluggish and you may not be able to move as well and so forth. The topic is a lot more complex. This is kind of what I get from what I've studied on it. Um, but it's critical for your body to keep your potassium levels at the proper level. And this doesn't even get into what happens in a cardiac situation. Um, I believe in a hypoechlemia state where you have less potassium, your heart rate actually starts to beat too easily. That's for another lecture and topic. So anyway, that's kind of the gist. If you don't take enough potassium, um, your nerves work slower, the muscles work more sluggish. If you take too much potassium, your nerves react too easily, action potentials too easily, and your muscles may contract too much. That's just the general gist of that. Now let's talk about what happens at an axon terminal. So that's what we see here. Now remember the axon terminal is at the very end of the axon. So we've had depolarization and action potential traveling down the neuron. And then it finally reaches this axon terminal. So you can see where my cursor is. Oh, notice what these tubes are. Do you remember those, are, those tubes were um, part of the cytoskeleton that helps in moving vesicles up and down the axon. And then how there's little, um, for lack of a better word, feet to help move a vesicle up and down the these microtubes, what do we call that? Think about it for a second, what is that? We call that fast axonal transport. When the vesicles are traveling down those microtubules, and then we call it retrograde axonal transport when the, the vesicles are walking up the microtubules. So these vesicles are where the neurotransmitters are located. But that is not to be confused with an action potential. That's just getting the vesicles and the substances that were made through protein synthesis down, as I mentioned in previous lectures. So I just wanted to reorientate you to that. So now we're going to talk about how are these vesicles going to be secreted after the action potential. But remember, this is how the vesicles got there to begin with, in part. So anyway, here's those microtubules and the vesicles are walking down. And that was fast axonal transport and retrograde, it goes up. So now we have our neural transmitters. Again, for the sake of this class, we're just gonna talk, or at least for now, over this particular lecture, we're talking about acetylcholine. So these vesicles are sitting in here and then they can undergo exocytosis. Remember, that's when the membrane joins, the vesicle membrane joins with the cell membrane, the neural lemma, opens up and the neural transmitters float out into the synapse. So what triggers this is when the action potential reaches the axon terminal. That is what will trigger these vesicles to undergo exocytosis. But it does so with the use of calcium. So calcium channels are actually important, again, for doing a physiological process. Remember we talked about how calcium was so important for troponin and tropomyosin and all that stuff. Well, now we're gonna see that calcium is important for helping these neural transmitters undergo exocytosis after the action potentials travel down the neuron. So it's amazing, calcium is so important. It's not just for teeth and bones and stuff like that. And so here in this picture, we're seeing 
Maybe it's another neuron or maybe it's the motor end plate of a muscle, but the neural transmitters are being released. And then down here you can see, uh, volt, not volt, well not voltage gated channels, but we see um, maybe a, a sodium channel that opens up because of acetylcholine. So the, those red dots attach to receptors on this channel. That's what's shown in this where I'm pointing with my cursor, opening up, allowing sodium to enter and depolarize that postsynaptic cell. Remember, postsynaptic because it's after the synapse. Here's the synapse, and here's the postsynaptic cell. That obviously makes this the presynaptic cell. So in here in this picture, you can see an action potential is traveling down the neuron. It reaches these voltage-gated channels, more sodium comes in, and then it reaches these calcium channels, which I believe are probably voltage-gated as well. The calcium attaches to receptors on the vesicle, and then that vesicle attaches to the cell membrane, opening up, undergoing exocytosis, the neurotransmitters are released into the synapse, attached to a receptor, opening up the receptor channels, allowing sodium to enter. And then that's making the postsynaptic cell more positive. We call that depolarization. Now, this is just a brief, this again is happening within milliseconds. And then that acetylcholine is actually um, broken down with the use of an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. So here's the acetylcholine. If you look at my um, cursor, you can see that the acetylcholine attaches to the receptor, does its thing, and then an enzyme that I believe would be associated directly with this membrane breaks the acetylcholine, and then the sodium channel closes again, and it won't be open up again until another acetylcholine flows in and attaches to the receptor. Okay, so here's another picture of this. It's um, calling it cell-to-cell -cell conduction at the synapse. And so we have electrical synapses, which are very fast in conduction. So these are the gap junctions. Where do we see gap junctions again? We see in cardiac muscle, we've seen it in smooth muscle. Um, so those are the kind of cells. But in the case of nerve to nerve, we have chemical synapses, which are still relatively quick, right? I mean, it happened within milliseconds. Um, gap junctions, the depolarization is goes, will be going right through the membrane. And so it's just another picture kind of showing you similar action taking place, neurotransmitters being released and so forth. So calcium is, is what is involved and is again diffusing in a concentration gradient from the outside in internally. So here's the picture that'll be important for this lecture. I want you to diagram this picture here and give me a synapse, or a synapse, no pun intended. Give me a summary of what you learned in this lecture. Here we have our calcium channel. Um, and you can see that the red is representing the action potential traveling down. That means sodium's coming in. It reaches the voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium flows in. Calcium attaches to the vesicle and causes the vesicle to dock and attach to the membrane having exocytosis. The neurotransmitters are released. It's attached to the receptor of the postsynaptic cell. And if it's excitatory, it's gonna allow sodium to flow in. So here's sodium flowing in, thanks to acetylcholine attaching to the, the receptor, sodium's flowing in. And then acetylcholine esterase breaks down the acetylcholine, and then it, it's ready to go again at a later date. Or time. Acetylcholine 
is actually can be recycled or removed thanks to this enzyme. So here's the acetylcholine synthesis process. So again, remember acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. And so acetylcholine is made with the, thanks to enzymes in the mitochondria using CoA and acetyl-CoA. It joins choline and acetylcholine together, gets filled up in this um, vesicle. Exocytosis occurs, as we saw, because of it travels down the the action potentials travel down, as mentioned in the previous slide, and calcium comes in. That acetylcholine attaches to a receptor on the postsynaptic cell. Calcium flows in, as I mentioned before, and then acetylcholine esterase. In the previous picture, looked like little triangles breaking the enzyme, but that enzyme breaks acetylcholine back to acetate and choline. Some of it gets washed away because this is a fluid. The synapse is a little space. But some of the, the choline can also be shunted back into the postsynaptic, or excuse me, the presynaptic cell. So this, this choline can be pumped back in and recycled as well. So this is the fate of acetylcholine. It gets released through exocytosis, gets chomped up with acetylcholine esterase. Some of it flows away, some of it gets recycled, particularly choline gets recycled back into the enzyme and then goes through this cycle with the thanks of mitochondria and enzymes to make acetylcholine. And that's what is showing how these neurotransmitters can be inactivated. Some of it is flowing away, like in the bloodstream. Some of it's being broken down, like number two, that could be an acetylcholine esterase, or if it's a different neurotransmitter, excuse me, it'll be a different um, enzyme to break it down. Also a major player could be glial cells. Remember, glial cells are the support cells of neurons. It can be myelin sheath and other types of, those are with glial cells, depending on talking about the central nervous system or whatnot. They can also absorb the neurotransmitters. So anyway, that's how some of the neurotransmitters get recycled and, and removed because we can't, we want those, we want those neurotransmitters released, open up the receptor, do something to the postsynaptic cell, disappear, and be ready to do its thing again on the next action potential that travels down the neuron. So I think this is a good place to stop, um, just because I think we have quite a few things, we have quite a bit more to cover, there's probably another 20 or 30 slides to finish this up, this uh, section on neurons. So, again, for your summary, I want you to summarize what you've learned, and I want you to explain um, this slide here and draw it and diagram it. Some of this may show up on some other homework assignments, and if you haven't already figured it out, um, the study guide will be your take home portion of the exam if you want to get started on that for the neurons. And um, then I'll again do a normal exam. Make sure if you haven't done so, get those muscle homework done and get on to uh, preparing for your oral exam if you haven't already done so for muscles. Anyway, that finishes up this lecture. Thanks for listening.